Greetings. My name is Linda Smith Charles, class of 1974 and chair of the Smith College Medal Committee. On behalf of the Medal Committee, I am so excited and honored to welcome this year's medalists to our virtual roundtable conversation about their experiences at Smith and the impact of those experiences on their beliefs, careers, and contributions in their respective fields. The Smith Medal was established by the trustees of the college in 1962 and first awarded in 1964. Since that date, the medal has been awarded annually to a select number of alums who epitomize in their personal and professional lives the true purpose and value of a liberal arts education. The medal committee, which includes representatives of the trustees, alum community, and Smith faculty and staff, conducts exhaustive research on all nominees for the medal and recommends a slate of four candidates annually for the trustees approval. Our committee's work to develop each slate of medalists includes very thoughtful and deliberate consideration of the outstanding accomplishments and contributions of all nominees. We encourage the nomination of Smithies who exemplify the richness, inclusive diversity, and the collaborative and creative spirit of our extraordinary alum community. Our medalists serve as role models and inspirational leaders across national and global landscapes. They encourage, motivate, and challenge us through their vision, innovations, and their contributions. We are extremely proud of our medalists and their achievements. When our committee met virtually in February 2021, to select this year's medalists, we certainly could not have predicted the relevance of each of their backgrounds and contributions to this historic and challenging time in which we currently find ourselves. Our medalists are truly phenomenal. I am honored now to introduce our faculty liaison to the medal committee, professor of film and media studies, and director of the Khan Institute, Alexandra Keller, who will moderate the conversation with this year's medalist. Alex, thank you. Thank you, Linda, for sharing your thoughts to get us started. We have a great conversation planned with our 2022 medalists, former US representative and global security expert, Jane Lakes Harmon, class of 1966, gender equality advocate Mona Sinha, class of 1988, civil rights leader and president of the American Civil Liberties Union, Deborah Archer, class of 1993, and entrepreneur and founder of Green City Growers, Jesse Van Hazel, class of 2006. How does Smith resonate with you and in your work? especially during the pandemic and current times in our society. Uh, congratulations to my sister medalists. Uh, you're all so interesting and, uh, and so special and worthy of this, I must say. Um, how does it resonate? Uh, it always resonates. Um, my Smith education taught me self-confidence, something I say to any, any moving thing. Uh, and that self-confidence has helped me achieve a professional dream, which is to be in elected politics, to achieve a personal dream, which is to be uh, the best parent and grandparent I can be, and to embrace the world in, in, in all of its diversity. And especially at a moment like this, when uh, I'm wearing the colors, Ukraine looms large. Uh, I just feel well equipped uh, to be part of this and you know, very happy as the obviously oldest person in on this Zoom, uh, to still be breathing and vertical and engaged. Smith creates women leaders, and that's what the world needs today. Uh, during the pandemic specifically, we saw how women leaders across the world rose to the occasion and 
tackle the issue head on without any political machinations, which we saw in full regalia, right, in the United States. So I think Smith taught us how to be critical thinkers, how to be creative problem solvers, how to put communities above ourselves. And um, I think the skills that were successful that we saw were that women led with empathy, women were collaborative and thought about solutions as a community. And that helped them really tackle their own you know, country's problems. Um, and those are the skills I use every day in my work. And I think learning those skills at an early age I think your early teens and 20s are so formative. Those skills stay with you and those values stay with you. So Smith definitely makes a very important and indelible impact on us as alums, but just through us on society at large. I certainly agree with everything that Jane and Mona have said, particularly around uh, women in leadership. We are seeing a new generation of women leaders. We're changing the paradigm and the meaning of what it means to be a leader. And Smith has certainly helped prepare us for that. Uh, but also for me, Smith is about a uh, community, a community of women coming together in scholarship and sisterhood and a community that really has continued long after graduation. I've learned so much from other Smithies. I've been challenged and pushed in the best possible way by Smith women, and I have found support and people to commiserate with um, in other smithies. And as we've identified so many of today's problems um, in the world are about community, the pandemic, people making incredible personal sacrifices, not only to protect their own health, but the health of the most vulnerable among us. Throughout the community, um, we work together to break down the silos that limited the impact of assistance uh, to the most marginalized members of our community. We saw incredible cross-sector collaborations. And the same was true around the response to the racial reckoning that began in 2020. People were ready for the moment because of the work of activists and organizers and lawyers and elected officials who worked together in community over many years. And the result was that we saw a broad and intentional network of people with deep relationships in communities who are ready to do the work of supporting both the protests and also the calls for transformation, of supporting the communities that were most impacted. And we're seeing the impact of networks and infrastructure and coalitions that have been built and nurtured over a decade. So with every problem we face as a society, moving forward together as a community is going to deepen our potential for change and impact. And I think we should all call on the lessons that we learned at Smith about being in community as we move forward. I obviously agree with everything that has already been said. You know, I think for me, um, you know, my experience with Smith, the way that I engage with the world is this feeling of needing to, or wanting to do something, of like feeling that, uh, seeing things happening and feeling like I want to in some way help or be engaged or learn more um, and that kind of curiosity and that drive to be involved and to make a positive change in the world can kind of directly relate back to my experience with Smith and um, you know wanting to learn a lot about a lot of different things. So I feel like that really carries over into my current self and, and the way that I want to engage with either um, causes or things that are taking place that are directly related to me. Um, so, you know, in my industry, climate change, um, but also just everything else that's going on in the world and how can I learn, how can I engage? You know, that really feels like kind of a Smith thing <laughs> to get out there and to, you know, feel like you wanna be a part of it and do positive change um, for yourself and for people around you. Um, so that desire to be engaged has been like a huge part of how I see kind of my education engaging with, with what's going on in the world right now. I um, mean, obviously there's a lot going on in the world right now and there's lots of different ways that we can put ourselves out there and, and be involved, um, either through just learning about what's happening and feeling like we have an understanding of it or actually going out there and doing something. Here you all are from across the spectrum of graduates of Smith. Can you reflect a little bit about the the Smith Network? For me, the, my Smith Network began the day I graduated and has continued to today. When I was um, elected to this position with the ACLU, I heard from Smith women across the country I've, who I've never met, who reached out to say that they were proud of me, to reach out um, to say that they supported me, to reach out to let me know to call on them if I ever needed anything. And I have in fact called on many of them 
because the work is hard. Um, being a woman leader is hard and we require um, support and resources. And so I have called on all of the women um, who are Smith women who have reached out and said that they wanna be there for me and they have been there for me. It has been really powerful to have that kind of support seen and unseen um, because I was a Smithy. I um, have had really fantastic experiences um, post-graduation with the Smith Network. Uh, I kind of first and foremost in graduating kind of look towards, you know, how can I be a part of an alumni network? And so um, I had previously lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a part of the alumni club there. I'm up in Portland, Maine now. I'm part of the alumni club up here. Um, and it's just such an incredible network. I have a diverse network, um, an intergenerational network of Smith women that I find, you know, the kind of the, co the connector is Smith, but everyone's just like this really awesome <laughs> kind of engaged human um, that I feel like I'm honored to have been able to meet and, and learn from over the years. I also have had the wonderful experience of having Praxis um, interns mm -hmm. at my company every summer. So that was a really great engagement with active current students. Um, so, you know, being able to kind of stay connected to current Smith students, Having an individual with us every summer um, was always really a fantastic way to kind of keep that intergenerational gap going all the way down into people who are current students as well. So that last comment reminds me that back in the dark ages in uh, 1964, I know it was mentioned when I got the medal that I helped bring Hubert Humphrey to campus, but that summer uh, there was a faculty member who started the Smith in Washington program. This is before the Praxis uh, program. And I was on it. Of course I was on it. And I was a, you know, uh, interned at the Young Democrats of America at night. And I worked for the Public Housing Administration. I already loved politics, but it was such a, an, a, an experience that gave me the grounding to think I could actually accomplish something in politics. And I met all kinds of leaders that helped me uh, uh, with Trudy Rubin, who was a year ahead of me and who's still a dear friend and is the only full-time foreign affairs reporter who happens to be a woman for a newspaper. We got Humphrey to come and it just launched things for me. And it's still true. I mean, I, I was the first Smithy elected to Congress, but then there were two others, uh, one of whom still serves in the Senate, Tammy Baldwin. And it's, it's a bond, it's a thing. And it's always gonna be a thing. And you can just feel the energy here. I, I mean, it's, it's an amazing uh, opportunity that we all had. I would just add, Jane, you reminded me when you were talking about your experience in DC, there was one summer when I had the opportunity to do an internship at the Department of Justice in, uh -huh. in DC, but I couldn't afford housing in DC. And I reached out to the Smith Alumni Association in Washington DC and a wonderful alum allowed me to stay in her home um, yeah. free of charge for the summer. Food was always available. It was wonderful. And I really would not have been able to take advantage of that opportunity had it not been for Smith. And, and by the way, one last thing. After Congress, my next career was a decade uh, as the first woman president and CEO of the Wilson Center, where we attract incredible interns from all over the world. And my, my parting uh, wish, and it it's now has money in it, was a fund to pay the interns who come in the summer because guess what? A number of people can't pay the rent, can't, can't afford to do it. And who are those people? They're at least half the, the brightest in the talent pool that we want to attract. So, uh, you know, maybe the Justice Department now can pay and you don't have to rely on the generosity of Smithies. Uh, but just saying, I mean, we really need to have a system where people uh, who ne can't necessarily afford it are also in, in the, the recruiting pool for the best and most interesting jobs. Yes, I think for me, the Smith Network is both professional and very personal. Professionally, when I decided to you know, take a job on Wall Street, it was not easy in the 80s to sort of open that door. And being a Smithy definitely helped because interview after interview after interview, people resonated with Smith and would draw on their connections to Smith and so forth. But I think it's more than that. For me, the Smith Network is personal because I came to a, a foreign land alone and this is where I created a chosen family. And I mentioned my advisor, uh, Cynthia Taffmore. She gave me her house key the first time she met me and I had it till the day I graduated. I've lost two dear friends during this pandemic and Padma Chala was my roommate. And she really taught me how to break rules because I was a very serious young person. 
And I remember when Hurricane Gloria was supposed to hit and we were all told to huddle down, you know, in Hopkins house, the two of us were running down to India house to buy samosas and breaking all the rules and getting into trouble. But that that's what she taught me. And my first Smith friend, Brenda Davis Landini, was all about unconditional love. And there were moments when I was like, I don't understand this. I don't understand what people are saying. I don't understand this language. And she'd be like, it's OK, you'll be fine. Let me help you out. And you know, people who welcome me into their homes um, during breaks when I couldn't go home, or whose parents or aunts, you know, gave me internships. I, those were incredible moments. And today my Smith network is so full because I have hundreds of mentees, literally hundreds, and they bring me as much joy as I guess what I bring to them. You know this, when you mentor someone, their success brings you more joy than anything that you can achieve. So Denise has a term called the Smith Network at Work. It really works. And I'm a part of many networks, as are all of you. And the Smith one is the one I lean into for everything, for happy occasions, when I need a shoulder to cry on, when I'm deeply frustrated with Washington and you know all the politics and stuff going around, the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, that's who I turn to. So I think this is a lifelong bond. And as you said, Deborah, the Smith afterlife is as beautiful and amazing as the Smith life on campus. So it matters. The choice to be collaborative, not competitive, seems to be at the core of the Smith network. And what you just said, Mona, about the joy you take when someone you have, have mentored goes to their realization. I suppose that's a good way to, to pivot to another question, which is, uh, the importance of networks always, but never more uh, than during the pandemic. Uh, and, and what are your reflections about your life, your work, uh, how, how you were challenged, but what you made of those challenges and what you see as ways forward, given everything that you have done, have come to understand? I think early on in the pandemic, um, I had some big losses and it, it, made me think about how I could show up for everyone else. And I decided at that time that I was gonna take any call, any email, anyone who reached out to me. Um, and that was exhausting, but it was also realizing what people were experiencing um, and seeing what was going on in the world, seeing the people who most suffered in, in light of all the racial reckoning that was happening, the reality that the frontline workers were being denied um, access to medical care and had to show up day after day after day when they had no guarantee of their life, let alone anything else. I chair an organization called Women Moving Millions, and I doubled down and said, all right, every week we're going to hear from some of these leaders because they need our help, they need funding, and we've got to get up there and, and support them. And the shocking things, we had um, the president of uh, the National Association of Domestic Violence do a talk and she broke down in tears because she said, domestic violence shelters are not regarded as necessary institutions. So we get no funding. And so we began a drive and we got her the masks and PPE. And if you remember early in the day, that was a big thing that we didn't have enough protective equipment, right? Um, and during that time, I decided that we were gonna launch a hundred million dollar fund and I remember my executive director looking at me and saying, are you serious? And I said, if we can't do it now, when can we do it? And you know what was amazing is the community rallied and we raised that money in three months, which we had given ourselves a year. I think what I saw was there was this whole community of people who stepped up and said, where can I step in? What can I do? And it also created a really strong network. I realized who were the people I could call when I felt really awful or when I just needed a little bit of a mental break. Um, it has certainly changed the way the world thinks about work, right? I wish that was true in the day when we had to go you know, into really tough work situations. Um, it's really had people step up and talk about their issues. I mean, mental health, if you see the focus on mental health now, it's... It's actually in some ways wonderful that people can just come forward and share these experiences and you can't unsee once you've seen, right? So I'm hopeful. I mean, of course, I'm saddened by a lot of what I see and a lot of the terrible loss that was completely unnecessary. But I also see this community in this world come together in a way that I couldn't have imagined. So maybe it took something as awful as this to bring the world to its knees and realize that we can't continue the way we have in the past.
-hmm. Let me comment on the flip side of that, which is that it showed the power of the NGO community and personal grit and, and compassion. And it showed the impotence of government at so many levels. Um, I think our federal government w was particularly impotent uh, and willfully looking away from the problem for a long time. That's not true anymore, but there's still a lot of catch up to do. So people had to become uh, more resilient and the, the tragedies are huge. If government had performed better, uh, the impact of this would be far less. And I think we've learned that we have to do workarounds. And oh, by the way, I think again, back to my topic of this day, which is Ukraine, I think we have learned the, to our benefit that, that citizen action uh, can make a huge difference in the world, way beyond the things that we have perhaps been thinking about before. I mean, if this turns out to be uh, a successful confrontation of a, a, a megalomaniac leading Russia, and Ukraine survives this, and Europe is stronger, <clears throat> and the world is stronger, uh, that's just another lesson that has come out of these pretty dreadful COVID years. If I could pick up on something that uh, Jane said about failures at the federal government le level, uh, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, I think that one lesson that came out of that is the power um, that the state and local governments have to impact our lives. And I hope that's something we don't um, forget. And related to that, uh, I, I think a lesson we should all take is that the impossible is possible. There are so many things that our society said could never happen and they happened during COVID because they had to. Children who didn't have um, access to technology were able to get their hands on technology so that they could um, engage more effectively in education. We, we all were able to get free uh, vaccines and, and boosters. People who were hungry were able to get food every day, at least here in New York City. We just saw um, the way that government and NGOs and individual community members were able to come together to solve so many of the problems uh, that we've been told were unsolvable. It's important to highlight the way that COVID-19 changed the way that we talk about and engage um, on issues of racial inequality. I, I, there's an old saying that when America catches cold, black people catch pneumonia. And I was reminded of this saying as we saw the way that COVID-19 disproportionately ravaged black and Latinx communities. And it was a textbook ex example of systemic racism and systemic inequality. COVID-19 was introduced into a society and systems that are racially discriminatory in individual, institutional, and structural ways. People of color, we're not innately susceptible to coronavirus, but because of years of inequality, we're more likely to be exposed to the virus, less likely to receive medical care. We were at greater risk of developing complications and also experienced the disproportionate share of the social, emotional, and economic fallout from the virus and the lockdowns. And people were able to see systemic racism at work really vividly. And I think it has opened up conversations in so many other areas. I think I've just kind of ended on like a little bit of a personal uh, kind of how it affected me. But, um, you know, I, I at the time was, you know, running a, a company that installs and maintains vegetable gardens and farms um, throughout Northeast United States. And, you know, we found ourselves in a position where we had a choice to continue to do this work or to not continue to do this work when the pandemic hit. And so, you know, it, it was not even a really a choice. We were always going to do it. And I think that's something, again, kind of back to a Smith, you know, Smithies in leadership and looking towards, you know, feeling like you have to do something. Like it was like, this is going to be extremely challenging, but there's no way that we are not going to try to continue to grow food for people um, during a period where people are struggling with food access especially we had a lot of school programs that we were operating where students were no longer able to do school garden education. How do you engage them with that? You build out a whole virtual side of the school education program. You know, the innovation that took place at a necessity um, ended up being uh, really incredible tools that now are used moving forward. So I guess that's kind of a positive thing. Um, uh, you know, it was exhausting. Um, and one of the things that, you know, again, from a personal experience, 
that kind of feeling of resiliency of being literally at your most exhausted. And, you know, working in food systems and farming is not as exhausting as being a frontline worker um, or dealing with racial inequity. Um, it, but, it, you know, I felt exhausted. So, you know, if I'm exhausted, how exhausted is everybody else who is engaging in this like really difficult task in front of them? Um, and feeling, you know, the need to continue to move forward and the drive to move forward to be able to ensure that all people have equity, um, you know, equitable, um, you know, livelihoods and and are able to kind of like exist and live um, and be healthy, you know, feels like such important work that everyone is talking about on this call. And the pandemic really like kind of pushed that to the forefront. The Smith Network ought to be something you could bottle and share. One thing that I am hearing is just the transformational uh, experiences you had at Smith that have allowed you to do that work in other places. I want to say thank you to Smith uh, for this extraordinary gift. I came to Smith because it was my mother's dream. And then I figured out it had to be my dream. But now that I hear the new news that there's going to be a journalism major and all this stuff is happening at Smith, and these fabulous women are on the Zoom. Uh, and what a gift, uh, certainly what a gift to me to be part of this community and to have been part of it for so long and to feel the energy that Smith gives all of us. Whatever it is that's in the atmosphere there, it is, you know, it is infectious and it is fabulous. And to look at all the contributions everyone else on this call are making now, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's thrilling. So thank you, Smith. I do think it's important for me to say, for some of the folks who may be listening to this conversation, who are not um, feeling pure joy during their Smith experience, that that is also um, a reality of, of Smith sometimes. I had an incident in my first year at Smith where I had a racist note slipped under my door, calling me the N-word and telling me to go back home. Um, and I still, think so positively and have um, so much love for Smith in part uh, because of the way that Smith responded, uh, mm -hmm. the way that my friends um, and housemates in Tyler House responded to support me and the lessons that I learned about how to find power um, and my voice in disempowering circumstances um, to find strength through challenge. And those are lessons that I learned at Smith as well, not in, uh, in rosy circumstances, but lessons nonetheless that really do um, help me to this day. Deborah, thank you for that. And, and maybe that is a thing um, we wanna pause on a little bit longer. What is it that, that each of you can say uh, to help current students pull through those moments? One of the things that's good to have is perspective. It can be really, really difficult to look outside of what is going on directly in front of you or like thinking specifically about, um, you know, challenges of feeling overwhelmed with your academic course load or feeling like you are in no way, have no idea what you're going to be doing when you are leaving school or, you know, feeling overwhelmed by what's going on in the world around you and how can you focus on these, you know, learning about our history when you know, there's a war in Europe. A lot of times it's important to realize that these things are just this is kind of like what life is. <laughs> there's a lot going on at once. Um, and, you know, that in the end, it's it's really important to center yourself. A lot of people, we are all going through lots of different things. It's different for everybody. Um, so even if you consider your problems to be kind of lesser than um, somebody else's, it's important to sit on those, know that they're, that those feelings are real and to feel like it's okay to feel bad. And it's also that everything in the end will be okay um, because really that's all we got. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, moving forward and, and living your life. If I could just add, I agree with all of that, um, but the boom box of social media was absent in my day. We didn't have that. We actually had to call home on landlines, write letters uh, and watch. Uh, I can't remember if TV was in color yet. I just don't remember that. And so it kind of slowed down the, the impact of the changes in the world on, on all of us. But I remember uh, 1963 in my second year uh, when Kennedy was assassinated and the bell started ringing on campus and nobody knew what it was. And uh, then it became clear what it was and people just flocked into John M. Green or wherever uh, just to be together. 
and the campus basically stopped for a day or so. We all watched uh, the, the tragic events on TV for a couple of days and it brought the community together. I'm not saying that is the worst thing that's ever happened in the world, but it was a single moment where uh, those of us <laughs> then who had had a pretty peaceful experience uh, realized that that uh, you know our country's leadership had been shattered, and then it got worse. Uh, obviously, with Martin Luther King and and the Vietnam War and the rest of it back in the day, and you know we're seeing some of that again. But why I'm saying this is that Smith was there. Uh, Smith got it, got what the moment was. We are all beneficiaries. And and one last comment. I think failing and you know, talking about you know personal crises is painful and horrible, but it also makes you stronger. I've seen it in many respects. I failed, I'm sure all of you have. I, I, I ran for governor of California and lost. And you pick yourself up and you go forward and other doors open. And um, I'm not saying it works perfectly. I'm not saying there isn't pain, you know, losing a spouse, which I have done too, is painful, but you move on and you incorporate those experiences into uh, a better version of yourself. People often say check in on your strong friends because they're struggling too. Um, and so you can be strong and still struggle. Um, it's important, I think, for students at Smith who may be struggling um, on a variety of levels, levels that um, both Jane and Jesse have spoke about, to know that there are resources, far more resources at Smith than there were when I was there um, and going through what I went through that there are people who want to surround you with all of the support um, mm -hmm. and courage um, and, and strength that you need, people who have resources to help address all of the challenges. And what you should not do um, is to fight through in silence, to fight through alone, because you don't have to, because there are so many people who are there to, to, to help you and support you inside the college and outside of the college. Sometimes too, it's like the qualities that maybe make us good leaders can sometimes eat away at you. I suffer from all kinds of anxiety, but like a very, product, a very productive person. So there are so many tools out there, like what Deborah just said. I had no idea kind of what there was in regards to mental health tools and like recently found mindfulness um, and all different sorts of methodologies um, that you can do to help yourself. There's a whole spectrum of mental health. It's not just, you need to you know, go get medication or you need to be hospitalized or you don't have anything at all. There's an entire spectrum with all different kinds of treatments and support anywhere from point A to point B. Can we just pause on Jesse saying that she um, suffers from all kinds of anxiety, but is <laughs> an incredibly productive um, person. I am an introvert and I hate public speaking um, and yet am forced to do, do it every day. It just shows, you know, the, the, what we can do in those kind of models, we can accomplish anything. It's interesting because we were having a discussion once on the board of trustees and we were talking about our life at Smith and we had to describe it in one word. And it's so weird because a word that came to my mind was fear. And it wasn't something I was expecting to say. And it just came out and everyone looked at me and said, you fear? It's true. It was very fearful because, um, Part of it was being alone. Part of it was just navigating a whole new language. I didn't understand when people would ask me questions. In my house, there was a woman who was studying Indian religion and she came up to me and she says, oh, I need to learn about this, 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 and you can tell me this, this, this. And I was like, I have no clue what she's talking about. I bought an old dog-eared version of the Bhagavad Gita and I read it because I'd never read it. And I remember telling my mom and she was like, well, at least you finally read it. But, you know, but it's kind of like being held not just as an individual and in who you are, but being representative of a whole culture and a community that, you know, you may not know everything about. And I think that was hard. Um, the other thing that was hard was just being on financial aid, you know, just being so scared that I was going to run out of money. And um, and in many ways, that sort of informed my decision to go to Wall Street because I never wanted to feel that. I never wanted to feel that I had to count every penny, that I, you know, I used to work on campus jobs, of course, as part of my aid package, but I used to babysit and walk dogs and all of this stuff. And it was like, what, $2 an hour or something ridiculous like that. There was that fear factor and a little bit of the, you know, not knowing if I could keep going because I remember my second year when they when I got my financial aid letter, they had not 
accounted for the increase in tuition as part of aid. So it was like whatever that 3% increase that all of a sudden I was responsible for. And I remember that feeling of, oh my God, I, I have to go back. I can't even afford this. I have to go back. And then, you know, as we've talked about the resilience and saying, no, I'm not going back. I have to figure out a way of doing this. As I say to students, the Smith afterlife is just so precious because you're not dealing with all the, you know, the things that we are afraid of often on campus. Let's talk about the relevance of liberal arts education in the development of leaders and creating a positive future, uh, especially in this year on democracies when the entire Smith community is thinking collectively about the broad topic of democracy. What's your advice to current Smithies about how to make change? I absolutely love um, that you are in the middle of a year on democracies and focusing on um, that broad topic. Democracy is, is truly fragile. I think we're learning that. And we have to fight to protect it every day. Um, and if the right to vote is the foundation of our democracy, we have to acknowledge that the foundation is really crumbling. And it starts with understanding the threats our democracy faces. Ignorance is really essential to the perpetuation of inequality and exclusion. And we need to fight against that. And I love that um, Smith is using this year to, to fight against that, that the ignorance that we all have about the many, many threats uh, to our democracy. Uh, but it also, the work to push back starts with voting and engaging in our political process, of course. Uh, but voting and engagement is just the beginning. As Jesse mentioned earlier, leaning into that Smith urge to want to do something um, is very necessary at this time. There are many ways to participate in our democracy. And I think the ability to protest, to speak out against those in positions of power is an important way that we should all be utilizing more this year and years to come. Peaceful protests have always been a powerful force to drive overdue reform and transformation of discriminatory policies and institutions. It's really a powerful reminder of the political power and strength in our communities. So use that power and that strength. Stand up and let your voice uh, be heard. And when we look out, out at the world right now, I think one of the emotions I feel most often um, is rage. Uh, and I know that many other folks have felt that um, as, as well. And, and Jane has talked about that a lot this morning, the kind of rage at what we see going on um, around the world, uh, rage over um, the injustices we saw come out um, of the pandemic. And women are far too often conditioned to be afraid of their rage. But rage has helped to build and sustain movements. It's led to meaningful progress. And so I encourage Smithies to harness your rage, to challenge the structural barriers that we see to participating in our democracy and other barriers and organize to dismantle them. If we are going to see deep change, we need to harness that collective fury and turn it into transformative fuel. Um, and we also, need to do two other things that I think about in the, in the context of my work. First, identify and dismantle the fundamental architecture of inequality in this country. And we are seeing that fundamental architecture revealed more and more every day. Uh, and second, help to build a new infrastructure that leads us towards equity and inclusion and justice. So for those interested in making change, I think you have to ask yourself, what are you prepared to help dismantle and then what are you prepared to help build? And I think that a liberal arts education, a Smith education gives us tools to both think about what we are um, prepared and equipped to dismantle, then also think about how we can build the infrastructure to a much more equitable and inclusive future. If I could just add to that, really excellent comment uh, in, in several ways. Let, let, let me say this, you asked about a liberal arts education. And boy, did we get one uh, at Smith, or at least speaking for me, boy, did I get one. I changed my major three times. I started as a physics major, don't ask. I moved to architecture, which I'm still passionately interested in. Then I moved to uh, political science. But I learned all kinds of things, like how to read Irish plays and, you know, go figure. And that stuff matters. And uh, being able to integrate uh, information from diverse sources, being able to have read uh, many of the great books has informed me in ways uh, I can't even measure. That's one. Second point on democracy, and I think 
Deborah would agree with this. Democracy is more than a free and fair election. Not that we don't need those. I mean, passionately need them. But democracy is a set of principles that have to do with uh, opportunity and uh, inclusion and respect and uh, freedom. Th these are principles um, way beyond just an election. Notice that many autocracies have unfree and unfair elections, but they're elections. Uh, so what does all of that mean? And uh, I, I, again, I think that coming equipped with a lot of diverse information and a way of, of analyzing it and, and the critical thinking that goes with uh, makes us all more effective. And the final point I would make, and uh, Deborah said this too, is it's not just tearing down bad stuff. We can, I hope, identify what's bad, but it's building good stuff. And building is much harder than tearing down. We saw that in the Arab Spring, where a number of governments were torn down and what came next wasn't, wasn't great uh, because people weren't prepared to do the hard work of building it. And so, um, again, those are tools I think that Smith has given all of us. It's certainly the instinct of every single person on this call to build, to build back better. Uh, it's not a partisan comment, just a comment. Uh, to, build, to build better, let's leave it that way. Brava Smith for, for helping us build those tools. There is a metaphor at Smith for change, and that is the addition to the library. I mean, this old crusty building, which was added to in a way that was not particularly uh, useful or attractive. And then comes Maya Lin, whose own story is amazing. And she adds these pieces that are green and that are functional and that are beautiful. And, you know, Smith is transformed. It's the liberal arts education component of this is about having multiple perspectives or understanding how to look at things from different ways. And I also, like Jane took, you know, I took an Old Testament class, you know, I took all these things I would never have thought that were not directly related to my major. I mean, that Old Testament class, I like, I understand so much more about like arts and literature and like popular culture now than I ever did as a Jewish person now understanding kind of like some of the roots of these things in uh, the world. So, so you don't even realize how much stuff is integrated until you actually open yourself up to reading different perspectives. And, you know, I think we're dealing with a period of time where we have a lot of people who have kind of closed off um, themselves from listening to other people. There's groups of people who feel very strongly about certain opinions. There's groups of people who very, feel very strongly about the opposite opinion. Those walls that are put up in so many different ways right now um, are, you know, hugely problematic to democracy and, um, and to equity. You know, how do you understand the perspective of somebody on the other side of the wall? Not necessarily how do you convince them of your perspective, but how do you understand where they are coming from um, so that we can kind of look at the fundamental issue and, you know, start to figure out a way to actually have something in common with the other side? So true. I mean, brilliant comments on this question. Absolutely. Now, for me, it's interesting because I hold two democracies in my hands, right? One that I was born in and one that I adopted. And I see the positives and the flaws in both of them. To Jesse's point, it's about having those difficult conversations. You know, with my work in the Equal Rights Amendment, I see how fundamental that is because to me, that's rooted in justice. It's not just about equality, whatever that might mean. Equal opportunity, yes. Equal access, yes. But where is the justice component of it? And how do we as a strong democracy lean into that and build that? And I think to have a vision of when you're rebuilding, what are you rebuilding? Like, what do you want the world to look like? You know, we can all rebuild everything. But like, Jane, to your point, when, you have, when you're an architect, you have a plan, you have a roadmap, you have a vision of what the end product is going to look like. And I think the liberal arts education, that's, that's the magic, right? Because we've all had different perspectives. I started out as an econ math major. I graduated as an econ art history major, you know? And it was all because I took one class in art history and fell in love. And that's what we have to think about is what do we want the world to look like? What do we want that finally built product, the house or whatever it is that we're doing plans for? What do we want it to look like? And once we've built the structure, what do we want the inside to look like? Because it's not just the structure, it's how it functions, right? So we have a beautiful house, but your kitchen doesn't work. Well, it's not really that great, right? So that's where I would say the liberal arts really helps us because we don't have one perspective. We bring many, many, many different perspectives to it. And we've learned that at Smith. So again, thank you. 
I have one last question for you all. If you could give your undergraduate self any advice about their years at Smith, for example, what should they not miss? What should they explore? What would it be? Smell the roses. I was pretty intense the more I think about it. Passionate about politics and and driven to do more and driven to go to law school. Uh, I would be less driven. And I I think that'd still be advice to myself. I would maybe just stop a little more. It's not that I haven't done it, but I think advice to Jane would have been slow down a little bit. Following up on what Jane uh, said, I think that I might have pushed myself more to also step outside of my comfort zone uh, as a little focused. So I might have done a semester abroad or take a math course or explore physics uh, like Jane. I really had a laser focus on getting to law school and focusing on civil rights. And I didn't take time to um, to push myself to step outside of that area. And it, this is awful to say, I graduated from high school and then college without ever reading any Shakespeare. I didn't read Shakespeare until I was in law school and being forced to by my, my classmates who were just outraged that I had gone through so many years of, of education. So I would have um, stepped outside, maybe traveled um, abroad, as I said. I would also say um, to my younger self not to make myself small, to take up space. I think I often um, would try to be as inconspicuous and as small as I possibly could, not speaking out in class, um, very reluctant to, to engage and put myself out there. And I think it's because racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, um, and so much more work in part by getting you to internalize messages of incompetence and inferiority and by getting you to believe that you don't um, belong in kind of elite spaces, that you haven't earned opportunity. And so a core strength and a constant challenge in life is learning to overcome those voices by doing even when you're not confident that you can do it and not to talk yourself out of stepping up to the challenge and to opportunity. And so I would tell my younger self that um, take up space, act like you belong because you do. I may be actually be coming from the opposite of perspective in regards to the hyper focus um, than the, some of the rest of you. <laughs> I felt a little bit like so I could have taken myself a little more serious. Maybe I skipped some campus events and things like that because I thought I was too cool for it. I could have spent a little more time really like utilizing and understanding the value of some of the community events. You know, I, I was taking like 8,000 different classes. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so I think that like lack of knowing what I wanted to do actually gave me the opportunity to try out a lot of different stuff without having the weight of knowing that, you know, you're working towards something um, post-graduation and go, please go downtown, find a friend with a car and drive around the Pioneer Valley. You know, there's a world outside campus um, and the Pioneer Valley is a really special place that you don't realize till you leave it. I would say a lot of what Deborah said, um, I felt there were moments at Smith where I didn't feel I belonged or that I was nervous that I had to, you know, get on that first plane and go home because I failed in some way. And I think part of the problem was we didn't see who we could be, right? Because we didn't have that representation that is so powerful. And I would tell my younger self, you know, believe that you can be that representation. Um, I think what I've heard from students when I was on campus all the time is just being inspired by just having that face on a board or having me on a panel and just believe in yourself. It's hard to do when you're sort of living it. It's really hard to do. Um, and the other thing I would just say real quickly is use the Smith community to build your chosen family. There is nothing more powerful and more joyous and more loving than that. You know, my, my mind is on fire and my heart is so warm from everything that I have, I've been listening to. So thank you all so much for this amazing conversation and, and for being so generous with your time. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I will now turn things over to Denise wingate Mater for some closing remarks. Thank you medalists for coming together for this amazing conversation. Hello everyone, I'm Denise wingate Mater. Vice President for Alumni Relations, and I too am an alum from the class of 1974. I want to thank all of our viewers, especially our students. We hope you've been inspired by this discussion and the perspectives shared by these outstanding alums. 
As a community, we are honored to lift up our alums and celebrate the amazing journeys they have had that began here at Smith. We know too that our alum community will welcome seniors to their ranks. Alums serve as mentors and models for our current students and most recent graduates. Like so many events, Rally Day has been unusual in these last two years, but seniors have rallied to celebrate in the true spirit of convocation with commencement on the horizon and the joy of the day. Thank you again, medalists, for sharing in this joy and for your connections and commitment to our beloved Smith College.